Everybody, Cinema Recap here, and today we're going to take a look at Focus. Spoilers ahead. We meet Nikki, and he's hanging out in a very swanky apartment, and there's some soft jazz playing over it. Up next, we catch him eating dinner in an upscale restaurant when he meets up with Margot Robbie's character, Jess, coming to her aid when she's being hassled by a man. And they end up having dinner together, and sparks are flying right from the start. Their unexpected date is so successful, it heads straight to the bedroom. But her husband walks in on him and puts a gun in our hero's face. It seems like he's staring into the face of death, but he's not so easily fooled. He catches on to their con right from the start and calls him on it. His obvious expertise in the field make the newbie's enthusiasm fizzle out. But it does lead to a more genuine date, where our baby grifter gets to learn some of his secrets. We hear all about Nikki's family's legacy in the business, as well as his grandfather's death from the Toledo panic button. Toledo. A move where you shoot your partner to prove you're for real. Anyways, Nick is smooth and charming, and Jess is sprouting some hard eyes after the first 30 seconds. And most importantly, the audience gets a lesson in pickpocketing, so, you know, we're all on the same page. The key is to focus. He drills that into her, and he leaves town the next day to head to NOLA for the Super Bowl, meeting up with his usual team of pickpockets and scam artists. But to no one's surprise, Jess follows along. Hey, he toys with her for a little bit, but I'm sorry. then she's given a warm welcome to their band of thieves. Mardi Gras is bonkers. There are people everywhere, and all her new teammates are speaking a language that she doesn't get. I'm sorry, what? This is her sink or swim crash course introduction to the field. Well, she aces it and is officially in with the cool kids. Next up, an intro into all their other scams. Pickpocketing, sure, but also rigging high-end poker tournaments, credit card and identity theft, fake ATMs to steal PIN numbers, buying valuable goods and then reselling them to make a less trackable profit. Incredible. Well, this operation is huge and slick as anything. They have warehouse space with a dozen employees and seem to have the city locked down. Well, Jess asks about the big con, the one that lets them all retire as millionaires. So what now? Nikki assures her that this is a volume business and keeping it small is what keeps them safe. Meanwhile, the vibes between Nikki and Jess are palpable, but for whatever reason, Nikki doesn't seem willing to seal the deal. There's a last minute swerve though, and once they make it back to the bedroom for real this time, all bets are off. Jess finds out that some of the details of his life are things he normally keeps to himself, really? which gives her that classic, he really likes me glow. But to the audience, it seems more like the first sign of a long con. Now, the Super Bowl itself hasn't even happened yet, and they've already raked in $1.2 million. The crew are ready to celebrate. Nikki takes home the 1.2 mil to keep it safe until they bust out of the city after the game, with a strict warning from his partner that there will be no gambling. And he and Jess scamper off to enjoy some more time in their little love nest. They share some more feelings, and Nikki tells Jess that she's probably the best grifter he's ever seen, and to a casual observer, it definitely looks like they're falling hard and fast for each other. And then Super Bowl Sunday arrives. Jess has to confess that she doesn't really like football. I just, I don't get the game. So they pass the time with some playful little bets between themselves. How did you know that? Yeah, it's all cute, but then it attracts the attention of a wealthy man sitting in the box next to him. Well, he gets involved. Five. And it doesn't take long for the bets to shift to the action of the game itself and start escalating piece by piece. Nikki tries to resist the urge, but our new friend is pretty insistent. Our poor, normally level-headed Nikki gets sucked in. They've gone from $1 bets to 50 grand, and Jess is trying to shut it down, but we're going. Nikki is all focus. He may be an incredible con artist, but apparently he's a terrible gambler because it only takes a few minutes for him to lose everything. Not everything in his wallet. Everything. The whole 1.2 mil. I love it. Everyone's money for the week. Well, Jess is losing it. The situation has degraded very, very quickly into chaos. She tries to leave, but Nikki's determined to win the money back. He insists on double or nothing, even though he doesn't even have the money. Her wealthy friend gets to pick any player on or off the field, and Nikki will guess the number. What? The man resists for Nikki's sake, but he makes the deal too sweet to pass up. You're fucking crazy. Jess will pick the number. Well, she's looking close to feigning, but the bet is on. It's her turn to pick, and she can't do it. Until she sees a familiar face on the field. Farad, 
a member of the team is standing on the field with the rest of the team wearing a full uniform with the number 55. She doesn't know what's happening, but she picks it. Number 55. The high roller admits that she won and hands over the money with a big smile on his face. Now down in the car with their winnings in hand, Nikki fills her in on what happened. The high roller was not next to them by mistake. He was their mark. Nikki planned the whole thing. And then the team spent the whole week priming him to pick the number 55. They put it everywhere, in his hotel room, in the street, in the car. And they even picked a song to play that'll make him think of it at the exact time he's picking the player. It's incredible. And Jess is walking on water. That is until the moment when Nikki tells her that the job is over, hands her her cut, and then gets out of the car. The job is over. And they're both looking heartbroken, and she's left all alone with the rug ripped out from under her. So three years later, Buenos Aires, Nikki's setting up a new con with some motorsport team owners and his clients. The plan is for him to pose as a member of the crew who's angry enough at his boss, Rafael, that he's willing to sell their super secret special fuel. Instead, he's going to sell them something else that will tamper with their cars just enough to secure the win for his clients, but not enough to cause suspicion. So that night he heads to their pre-race party, scamming the crowd into believing him as a drunk, belligerent member of the crew. And he's on top of his game. That is, until Jess walks in. Well, she's turned over a new leaf, apparently, and she's dating Nikki's new client for the last couple of years. Nikki loses his grip on the game and decides to drown his sorrows in apple teenies instead of focusing on the job. He's genuinely thrown and doesn't seem like the guy that gets thrown off very much. Well, he manages to get through the staged fight they had planned with Raphael, but between his shock about Jess and the tray of cocktails he's chugged, well, he gets a little carried away, slapping Raphael around and accusing him of stealing from him. He did enough, though, because he still gets the other team tracking him down to try and buy his Raphael's secret fuel from him, just like they had planned. Nicky has 75% of his attention on Jess every second, but he scrapes through making the deal. Meanwhile, we get a taste of Jess's new life. She's dressed and treated like the wife of a billionaire. She sees a woman drop her purse on the street and spends the rest of the afternoon tracking down her home address. Of course, there's no woman there, just Nikki, and he's begging her to run away with him. But she shows him that she's all grown up without him. Well, Nikki's not easily dissuaded. Farad shows up to help him with the main con, and there's no doubt that they're planning something to do with Jess as well. Farad tracks her down to catch up and lets her know that Nikki's barely worked since New Orleans. He even kept the necklace that she wanted way back in the beginning all those years. It's a sweet gesture. And it's enough to convince Jess to at least meet Nikki for a drink. He's swearing up and down that he's changed and all he wants for her is to believe him. He says it's not a con. She seems to soften, but it's still not enough. The necklace gets returned and she goes home to her hunky new boyfriend. But not for long. Nikki heads back to his apartment to feed it, but Jess is waiting for him. She's upset. They just move their reconciliation straight to the bedroom. Nikki tries again to get her to give it all up and come with him. Well, she's torn, but they don't have time to work it out because Raphael's aggressive associate shows up. And Jess is forced into an elaborate escape routine and they narrowly avoid getting caught. So Nikki gets to work. He not only sells the real version of the thing to the other team instead of the fake one, but he also sells it to every other team in town. And walks away with a trunk full of millions and millions of euros. It seems like he's pulled it off, but then an anonymous text warns him that he's been burned. Well, he still doesn't want to leave without Jess, so he waits. And just when he's about to give up hope, guess who shows up at the doorstep? Together, they make a break for home. But they must have waited too long, because there's no way they're escaping Raphael's men this time. And they end up in his warehouse, tied to chairs with duct tape over their mouths. Well, he doesn't know how Nikki got the real fuel formula to sell, and doesn't know what Jess had to do with it, but it's clear that he's very, very angry. Well, Nikki holds his tongue until Raph starts suffocating Jess to death. And that's what cracks him. He admits that Jess is how he got the insider information that he needed, but she didn't know she was doing it. We get a flashback to all their interactions, revealing that he was playing her the entire time. The way he gained her trust, the manipulative techniques he used, they all led to him getting Raphael's own password to log on and steal his fuel formula and then sell it all over time. Oh, Jess can't stop crying. And that isn't the end of it, though. Turns out, Raph and Jess weren't really dating. It was a scheme. He was trying to steal his watch. Jess was trying to play Raphael to steal his money and his watch, but he hadn't reacted strongly because 
He thought she was just a bimbo with a scam. When Nikki showed up, she used it to her advantage and kept the con going. She made Nikki see what she wanted him to see. She orchestrated every moment that he witnessed, everything she could to convince him that she was Raphael's partner and string him along. Now they're completely screwed. Nikki is genuinely shocked and tells everyone that he's just sick of it all and never wants to lie again. He opens his mouth to tell the real story. And we're waiting for round three of the big reveal, but it's too late. Raph's henchmen shoot him in the chest. Jess rushes over and tells him she loves him probably for the last time, while Raphael tells the henchman to clean up his own mess and flee the building. Of course, that can't be the end. The henchman comes back, and before Jess has the chance to fight him off, he reveals that he was on the inside as well, and they just pulled a Toledo panic button. He has a plan, and Nikki's not gonna die, probably. He reveals that he shot Nikki in just the right spot, and he's the one who knows how to fix it. Well, Nikki wakes back up, and they're all good to go. The henchman seems weirdly invested in Nikki's survival, and when he calls him by his childhood nickname, Jess figures out what's going on. You're his dad? The legendary con man that Nikki inherited all of his knowledge from. During their daring escape, we get a little bit more backstory about Nikki and his dad. Turns out Bucky, the famous con man, picked up Nikki off the street as a child. He trained him, cared for him, but Nikki was always a good person no matter what, so he turfed him back out. Then, the next time he found himself in a dangerous situation, he was just worried about Nikki. Love will get you killed in this business, goes his motto. You know, there are a lot of truth reveals in a very short amount of time, and it's enough to make a viewer's head spin. Bucky decides to bounce, take all the money with him as punishment for Nikki being so soft, so Nikki's left with no money and a punctured lung, but he has his girl. She slings his arm over his shoulder and helps him walk through the Buenos Aires dawn. It's pretty clear that they're gonna find a way to work it out. Two con artists together, happily ever after. Thanks for sticking through to the end. This was our recap of Focus, released back in 2015 and produced by Warner Brothers. Please, if you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like. And if you feel the channel, hit subscribe for more cinema recaps.